One of the areas where public policy change has happened the fastest is in the area of gay rights and gay marriage. And so in the, uh, I, I presume in the uh, lifetime of anybody listening to this podcast, they, they remember when such ideas, an idea like gay marriage would have just been off the table, not socially acceptable, not politically acceptable, no legal way to make it happen, just, just off the table. And then this was reaffirmed with, you know, different uh, uh, voter initiatives in, in several states. Uh, well, now that's completely different. Okay, and and public sentiment changed uh, first. Welcome to Acton Line a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. You just heard Joe Lehman, president of the Mackinac Center, speaking on the Overton window and the influence it continues to play in politics and how we can use it to understand changing ideas in our culture. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Joe Lehman, welcome to Act in Line. Thank you very much. It's great to be here, Eric. We're going to talk about today the Overton window, concept of the Overton window, how people understand the Overton window, what it actually is. But let's, before we get to the concept, let's start first with who was Joe Overton? Joe Overton is one of my favorite subjects. Joe was a friend of mine, a close personal friend and a colleague. And I worked with Joe uh, professionally at the Mackinac Center for uh, 13 years. But I actually met Joe for the first time when Dow Chemical Company assigned him to pick me up at the airport for my job interview as an engineer at Dow Chemical, and that was all the way back in January 1986. So Joe picked me up at the airport. His job was to take me to dinner to make sure I didn't get lost on the way to my interviews, and we quickly learned we had a love of the same kinds of ideas because that very night we discussed the morality of seatbelt laws, which were just coming into effect in Michigan. Joe Overton, is he's at Dow Chemical then. How does he end up at Mackinac? How do you end up at Mackinac? Yes. So, so Joe and I worked as uh, as engineers at Dow Chemical and a huge company, of course. Uh, we had similar jobs but did not work closely together. And what eventually took us both to the Mackinac Center was not a, a path, a career path that we could really recommend for anyone else because uh, it was full of unexpected uh, uh, turns. Uh <clears throat> because how do engineers end up in the public policy world? But we were both interested in ideas and in addition to uh, engineering. And we were both interested in the ideas of liberty. Joe actually had some background with the Libertarian Party of Michigan, which was small then. It was small now. We were both uh, young men in our, our 20s and very idealistic about a lot of things. And – Joe and I had known each other for about a year when he met a man named Larry Reed. And Larry Reed, uh, who's now the retired president of the Foundation for Economic Education, when Joe met him, Larry was getting ready to move to Midland, Michigan, which is where Joe and I lived, to open an actual brick-and-mortar office for a brand-new think tank called the Mackinac Center in Michigan. And the founders of the Mackinac Center had run that institute for about a year, but with all contract labor and no real full-time staff. And they knew they needed somebody full-time, so they hired Larry. Larry was on his way to move to Midland and met Joe. And then Joe said to me, hey, this guy, Larry Reed, is moving to Midland, and he's going to open a think tank. And I may have said something like, really, what? what's a think tank? And uh, we... Uh, we got interested in the things that Larry was doing with the think tank called the Mackinac Center, which was in its infancy then. Well, Joe was single. I was married. Uh, 
Joe uh, quickly saw that he wanted to do more and more with the Mackinac Center. So he began transitioning from Dow to Mackinac. He went to school at night to get a law degree and uh, began volunteering for the Mackinac Center. And he ended up leaving Dow and going to the Mackinac Center and immediately tried to persuade me to do exactly the same thing. And my exact words to Joe, I believe, were, I will never leave Dow Chemical. <laughs> <laughs> Famous last words. Famous last words. Uh, however, uh, less than two years after that, uh, a close childhood friend of mine died at a young age. He had been my college roommate. He had been my pastor's son. His name was uh, Steve Walters, and he died quite unexpectedly. And that really uh, gave me uh, a new look at my own mortality and how uh, uh, made me rethink how I wanted to spend my vocational energies. So the thing that I said I would never do is exactly what I did. And on January 13th, uh, 1995, I left a perfectly good engineering job at the Dow Chemical Company and went to the Mackinac Center and essentially got to the, got to the Mackinac Center and said, well, here I am. Uh, what needs to be done? What do I do? I had shrewdly negotiated a cut in pay for myself to work with Joe and with Larry. And uh, so uh, we made me director of communications and uh, Joe and Larry taught me everything I needed to know at that point. So that was how Joe and I met and really began working together. Before we get back to Joe Overton and the Overton window and get to that, uh, for people who aren't familiar, uh, tell them about the work of the Mackinac Center. The Mackinac Center is a think tank that focuses on public policies that affect mainly the state of Michigan. And we study economic policy primarily. We don't do much with social policy, although, of course, there's always, there's always overlap. But the, <clears throat> the, the Mackinac uh, Center is grounded in pretty much the same ideas as the Acton Institute. So the, uh, the, the traditions of uh, liberty and freedom, uh, thinkers, uh, thinkers like uh, John Locke and Adam Smith, uh, Lord Acton, of course, and, and, and some, of, some of the scholars at the Acton Institute are on the board of scholars of the Mackinac Center. And so I believe Father Sirico has referred to us in the past as kissing cousins, uh, which, is, uh, which is pretty apt. So uh, the Mackinac Center uh, is among the very largest of around 50 state-based think tanks who work in almost every state. And uh, as I said, we do our work at the state uh, at, at the state policy level. You know, it's our belief that the way to save the country is uh, by looking at the Constitution as a model and remembering what Ronald Reagan said is, uh, which was that the federal government did not create the states, the states created the federal government. And so we believe the change we need starts in the states. What was Joe Overton like? Joe was described by almost everyone who knew him as intense. And he was intensely smart and in <laughs> intensely funny. I can't even say it without laughing. And a man of a remarkably high character. In fact, uh, you could say that when, when Joe entered a room, he sort of elevated the standards of everyone around him. He, he just sort of had that kind of, uh, that kind of charisma. It wasn't a backslapping charisma and it wasn't uh, as a, the kind of charisma that a great orator might have and be able to uh, cast his spell over, over a crowd. Uh, although he was a fine speaker and he could tell a good joke, that, that wasn't uh, how how he led. He was he was deeply, deeply committed to these ideas, and so I, I knew him also as as an engineer. And so he was he was unusual as an engineer. Not that he could really dig into the details of something, because engineers tend to be good at that. Uh, but he also he so he could see the he could see the forest as well as the trees. And he could see every leaf on the trees and the vein of every leaf. And uh, Joe, uh, Joe and Larry Reed, Joe Overton and Larry Reed were a particularly powerful team uh, 
uh, working as the, the president and the executive vice president of the Mackinac Center because Larry had a million good ideas, but they all needed to be done right now or in the next five minutes. Joe also had a million good ideas, but they all required a 10-year master plan. And so it was my job to sort of wrestle their ideas down to earth and to kill most of them, uh, to be quite honest, <laughs> and focus on, you know, what we could actually, what we could actually get done. But uh, Joe was very, uh, very thorough, uh, a very thorough thinker and w was able to lay out uh, long-term plans, which as, as you and your listeners know – in the think tank business, uh, we're all about you know long term plans. Sure, we we pick ripe fruit if it's in front of us, but we're also the ones who can think about the harvest uh, years from now. I could ask this question about Joe Overton, but I can also ask it about you. How did being an engineer influence the work that you did within a think tank and on public policy? You said you, you typically don't get the connection of the two. I. I first think of if you go back to the progressive era, you do get a lot of talk about social engineering back at a time when a phrase like social engineering wouldn't have the negative connotation that it carries now that you have very much had a approach to uh, public policy to politics to how an, a country should run influenced I think by people with engineering backgrounds or that kind of desire to be able to engineer society. And I think most people who are in the space that we're in, you know, people who understand concepts like uh, Mises communicated in human action or Hayek in the idea of emergent order are less looking to engineer society and more looking to create the opportunity for people to be uh, to find human flourishing and fulfillment. So with that engineering understanding, bringing that now to policy work for you and for Joe Overton, how did that mix? How did it influence the way you approach things? That's a that's a really good insight about the progressive era and, and sort of an engineering mindset, Eric. And I think you have described a common trap that uh, engineers or engineering-minded folk can fall into when they want to – improve the world by becoming involved in the public policy process. They, they uh, engineers are system thinkers. And, and so they, they, you know, they may share that in common with uh, attorneys. There's a lot of overlap in the kinds of thinking that engineers and attorneys do. They've got to get into the details, but the, the whole systems are important too. And so the, the progressive era really uh, illuminated this fallacy that if we just bring enough technical expertise to the problem at hand, to whatever societal problem, to whatever social problem, we can solve it. And uh, you know, we've we've seen, uh, especially uh, today in in uh, this era of pandemic and lockdowns, the woeful, woeful limits of expertise. You know, and, and you don't have to wait for this pandemic to see that. Uh, uh, but engineers do – they can fall into a trap of kind of a, a technocratic mindset. And and I was bent a little bit that way when I got into this. I thought, well, you know, it, it, public policy – uh, public policy is going to be better if there are more smart people with technical expertise, you know, sort of turning some of the knobs. Well, of course, while we respect, you know, people's freedom, <laughs> and uh, uh, and it was uh, some of the uh, some of the arrogance or just naivete that maybe comes natural to uh, uh, guys in their twenties. But the um, what I really learned. Uh, from uh, Joe Overton and from Larry and from uh, so many others in this movement is uh, the the primacy of the human element. You know the 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 human element is what foils the plans of technocrats and what it's what makes uh, uh, you know puts limits on on expertise. And so, uh, really, uh, I, I guess at that point. At that point, uh, 
anyone who is an engineer getting into the public policy world, they've got to decide, okay, now that you see what the world is really like, it, it it's really more about people than about things or more about people than treating people like things. <laughs> uh, you've got to decide if, if are you going to adapt to that or are you going to just get out of, get out of the business? You know, even in one of the turns of phrase you use there that I think we hear in public policy conversations, um, as we try to deal with social issues and social problems, we talk about solving them. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things to me and, and listeners to this podcast and our other podcast, Act in Line, have heard me say numerous times is one of my biggest realizations has been largely we don't solve problems and that our goal, I think, really should be to try to make things slightly less bad over time is that is uh, consonant with an understanding of human nature and that, you know, this world is not perfectible. Uh, so you talk about thinking in terms of, of systems, right? It almost necessitates some kind of straight line thinking. It's like if we change this, well, it corrects the path and everything continues on. Well, then people change their behavior and based on the thing that you changed, it's, it's const- rather than straight line projecting, it's more like you know if you're engaged in that kind of, I think, engineering approach to it, you're more like herding cats, right? You're trying <laughs> to get a whole bunch of things moving in the same direction that really don't necessarily want to do what you want them to do. I think for, you know, for me, thinking about it that way is is humbling to understand uh, the the approach that I think we've been discussing is how do you empower individual people to find their own fulfillment and human flourishing by making the factors on the ground that they're operating off of as fair and just as possible. Yeah, and it is really hard to make that a satisfying campaign slogan or campaign platform. I, I believe you've really hit the nail on on the head, Eric. That that there really aren't solutions in uh, to problems that we see in the public policy world. And I think Thomas Sowell uh, summed it up by saying uh, that in public policy, there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. Mm-hmm. And so the, the the best we can hope for is a trade-off. And you'll choose your poison, so to speak. And and so that <clears throat> that is sort of a, a habit of mind that we have to cultivate is to Stop looking for solutions and look for trade-offs. And it is an uneasy fit with real politic because, you know, we uh, people who run for office are taking on a very difficult task. And they, they do somehow have to win election. And so they somehow have to persuade people uh, that – that they should put them in office and give some measure of authority to them over, you know, other people's lives. And and so it just doesn't sound very sexy to say, I'm not here to solve your problems. I'm here to point out the trade-offs or I'm here to choose a trade-off for you. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's not very exciting. And and as it goes for for Joe Overton, he he was so smart that he he could detail a policy prescription, let's call it a prescription and not a solution. He could he could detail it very finely. But uh, I think, you know, like all of us, he was still on his way to realizing the limits, uh, the, you know, the, the limits of that and the trade-offs. But he was deeply read and, uh, and far ahead of me. Hey, you've reminded me of a joke I heard from P.J. O'Rourke in a speech from him once of the inherent problem of the libertarian candidate for anything is it's you're the guy who has to get up there in front of people and say, I'm the candidate that can do less for you. In <laughs> fact, I can almost do nothing for you. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you should probably just do it yourself. Uh, and yeah, that, that is, it is a hard pitch. But as you pointed out, there's all the hard decisions in life are between two good things and two bad things. As the decision between a good and a bad thing is not a decision at all. It's just obvious. Uh, so talking about trade-offs is uh, is important and may be hard to, you know, you, you were in communications, I'm in communications, um, trying to find the ways to best communicate that reality, that there is no utopia, nirvana is not for this world, and we have to take these things into consideration when making these kinds of choices. It may not be easy, but it's certainly necessary work. So let's Let's talk about the Overton window because I think that actually dovetails pretty well into the Overton window as a concept. And I've been thinking of what is the best way for me to ask you about this. I could just ask you simply, what is the Overton window? But I think that would leapfrog over the fact that it has become, um, at least within very nerdy circles, uh, 
a well-used phrase, a description of a concept that may or may not accurately adhere to what the actual concept is. So let's do it this way. My understanding of the Overton window as I hear it used is you have this parameter in which you can take an idea and push it um, as you know, you want to push it as far close to what you actually want as possible. And it's almost like a negotiation tactic, right? That like you ask for way more than you actually want because when you back up from there, uh, you're backing up to what you would actually accept. Um, but if you start asking for what you would accept, well, then you're going to backtrack from there somewhat and get even less of what you actually want. Um, that moving the Overton window is to push the envelope on what it is you're looking for. So to expand the possibility in the future that you'll be able to get more and more of what you want. How accurate is that? Where is it right? Where is it wrong? And then give us the actual platonic definition <laughs> of the Overton window. <clears throat> you've, you've got the gist of it. The Overton window is all about persuasion and it, and it is all about changing the acceptable view of a certain idea. And so maybe the easiest one to uh, grasp uh, mentally is just to think of, uh, of an income tax rate. It can go, I guess, from uh, 0% to 100%, although, although there's <laughs> there a time in history when the effective income tax rate was over 100% at, at some high incomes, but that was uh, – we'll, we'll leave that out of, out of the discussion. But everybody can imagine a scale from 0 to 100. And so what's the ideal income tax rate? Well, nobody, nobody really knows, but people at any time have a view on what they think is, is right. And uh, I've, I've seen polling even fairly recently that uh, says Americans come in somewhere around 25 percent, you know, would be, would be fair. And a lot of other questions would have to be answered. But, but let's say your income tax rate is 25 percent, but you really think that it, a better income tax rate would be would be 20 percent. So you want to change the view of what's acceptable or maybe you want it to be 15 percent and you want to change the view of what's acceptable. <clears throat> you can't just decree let's go to a 15 percent income tax rate I even if you're an elected official because uh, that will seem too extreme of a jump and you might uh, – like you're likely to be voted out of office uh, if you if – you, go too extreme in either direction. So how do you actually get to a 15 percent rate or if you think it should be 40 percent, how do you get there? You make the case through persuasion and it's a little different than a negotiating technique. Technique, You know, the old, uh, uh, you know, sort of, um, oh, Maybe it, it, in some ways, it's a caricature, but the negotiating technique of saying, uh, well, I want 50 percent, so I'll ask for 80 percent. You know, that uh, – I mean, it might move you, but something else might have moved you just as well. It's not persuasive. You know, you're just saying I want it because I want it. That's not really what the Overton window is about. The Overton window is about making the case through uh, – uh, by appealing to logic, by appealing to emotion, and by appealing to authority for why another income tax or any other policy should be different than what it is. And <clears throat> so I would I would say it's a little it is a little different than the than the negotiating technique where you're uh, you know trying to give up you know you're willing to exchange something for something else. Um, you're really making a case to change the way uh, the world is. So I think of the Overton window as changing the frame, changing the range of acceptable options. And it's easy to think uh, at times when this has happened in history, in the many social movements we've had in, in this country and think of the big social movements. So we can um, – it, it was only I think 103 years ago that you could not vote in this country if you were female. Well, uh, now you could not get elected dog catcher in this country if you ran on a platform of women should not be elected – or women should not be allowed to vote. That, that, that's, that's, a, that's a huge change and it's um, – 
the Overton window had to change to do that. Uh, the <clears throat> I guess the simplest definition of the Overton window is the Overton window is – it describes a range of public policy options. The options inside that window are safe for elected officials to support without getting unelected and the ones outside the window are not yet safe for public officials to support because they'll risk getting unelected. So our job in the think tank world and in the journalism world and in, um, in the religious world and in the education world, our job is to change what is acceptable uh, by society because uh, the politicians will eventually follow. How did Joe Overton – come about this idea? It was driven by the need to improve our fundraising at the Mackinac Center. So the Mackinac Center, like the Acton Institute, uh, survives by charitable contributions. That's how, we, uh, that, that's how we pay the bills. That's how we do the work that has to be done. And we found that when we met with entrepreneurs uh, to ask them for support, uh, this is at the Mackinac Center in the early days, we would um, – Make the case and uh, make the case for the work of the Mackinac Center and tell them what we believed and what we were trying to do. And people across the table from us would say, well, I agree with all that. That's why I give money to fill in the blank political party or fill in the blank candidate for office. And so in their mind, the way to make change was to support the political process itself with their contributions. And we were doing a dismal job. Joe and Larry and I uh, – well, maybe not dismal, but we needed to be more successful. We needed to be much better at making the case for why the Mackinac Center needed to create an environment so that elected officials could do the right thing. And so Joe came up with this concept of the Overton window that showed how you could actually change the range of viable options that were viable in politics, that were viable in the legislature uh, so that they could – you know, good ideas could even get a vote. You know, abolishing the slave trade in, in Britain was a good idea. But it was voted on and voted down, uh, I forget now, maybe uh, – certainly more than a dozen times. But it couldn't even be brought up for a vote uh, before thinkers outside of parliament were making the case for it. So Joe wanted a graphic way to do this and he actually devised this really complicated uh, uh, brochure with a sliding frame on it that revealed and then obscured different policy options, kind of like peekaboo. He never called it the Overton window. He gave it a nerdy think tank name, the window of political possibilities. And, uh, and he actually never even made the brochure. Uh, he just uh, made notes and he talked about the concept a lot. And we named it uh, in his honor after he died tragically in 2003. We, we renamed it uh, Overton window. What's an example from the work the Mackinac Center has done where you've applied the concept of the Overton window to look at what the acceptable possibilities were for something at the time and then moved it uh, further and closer into alignment with um, a I more ideal or a more desirable uh, set of outcomes. Sure. Uh, there are uh, two, two big ones come to mind uh, that, that took a long time. One is in freedom in the labor market and that uh, one of our efforts there culminated in Michigan becoming a right-to-work state. And it actually – Michigan became a right-to-work state. Uh, this is the 10-year anniversary. It was, it, uh, uh, the law was passed in uh, December 2012. Um, <clears throat> what right-to-work means is that a unionized worker cannot be fired for refusing to support a union. So if you, you know, if you're a bricklayer and you, your workplace is unionized, it was unionized when you got there. Uh, you know, you've you, the, the union represents you whether you like it or not. Uh, 
Um, until right to work, you could be fired if you didn't want to pay dues to that union. Uh, and so this was – it may sound like a small thing, but it was a monumental change in Michigan, which in many ways is the cradle of organized labor in the United States and uh, the birthplace of the UAW. And so under the old regime, uh, under the old public policy, uh, unions uh, ran the show. Uh, particularly in government workplaces, much more uh, than than they do now, and so the Mackinac Center began shortly after we were founded. We began making the case for why our state should be uh, uh, free of compulsory unionism, and this idea was so far outside the Overton window, Eric that even our own friends said to us, would you please stop talking about making Michigan a right to work state? You're embarrassing us. Because it was so crazy. It was just that crazy. But, but this is what illustrates the power of the Overton window. It was also crazy to talk about women being allowed to vote. It was crazy to talk about abolishing the slave trade. You know, it was crazy to talk about uh, uh, civil rights laws in the 1960s. It was crazy to talk about an environmental, you know, strong environmental protections in, in this country, you know. Um, but <clears throat> this is the work that we did to, to move the Overton window means you make, you make the intellectual case. You say, I will debate anyone, anywhere, anytime on this. Uh, you try small versions of the policy, put them into practice and see how they work and if they work and where they're weak and where they need to be improved. And then eventually, uh, the politicians, they're the last ones to kind of come into place and ratify what the people sort of already want. So that um, uh, that's what happened with right to work. And public sentiment changed on right to work before the law was passed. And that's really important to understand about the Overton window. Michigan had what was referred to as a lost decade in uh, the years between, you know, roughly, uh, roughly 2001 and uh, 2000 or uh, 2010, 2011 or so. The state lost population. Uh, it was in, in decline in many ways. And I believe it was in 2006, the state's largest newspaper, the Detroit Free Press, which runs a quite uh, left-leaning editorial page, they – uh, did a poll, uh, and they found that a majority of people supported the idea of right to work and people not being forced to pay union dues if they didn't want to. This is shocking in Michigan because in Michigan, unionism is part of the heritage. You know, everybody's uh, everybody has a story about how a grandfather or an uncle was involved in an important strike where, you know, certain concessions were won for management. That's just part of the air in, in Michigan. And so this was a big cultural shift. And so that was an indicator to us that we were almost ready for right to work. Another example of shifting the Overton window has been in the area of school choice, and we see that taking place all around the country. And in, in Michigan, we, we've made progress where – and and we may uh, – uh, when, when the Mackinac Center began its work, there were no charter schools. There was no public school choice from one district to another. There were no magnet schools. You just simply went to the school the government assigned your kid to unless you could afford to opt out into a private school. Homeschooling was virtually illegal when the Mackinac Center opened its doors. Now, Michigan is uh, one of the uh, most uh, – has one of the most permissive homeschool laws in the country. Uh, we have robust charter schools with no cap on the number of charter schools. We have really robust public school choice. Uh, the only thing we still lack is any form of private school choice, but we're involved in, in litigation right now uh, to, to make that a reality. As you look at things that are happening on the national political level, um, where do you see the concept of the Overton window being applied to some of the bigger issues that we're looking at as, as a nation? And y feel free to give examples of things that from your own set of personal policy preferences that you like, that you don't like. Uh, where do you see examples of the Overton window being moved uh, from the what was previously acceptable closer to things that not long ago wouldn't have been thought of as even plausible. 
Yeah, great, great question, and and examples abound. You don't always have to wait a hundred years to see the movement in the Overton window. One of the areas where public policy change has happened the fastest is in the area of gay rights and gay marriage, and so in the I, I presume in the. Uh, lifetime of anybody listening to this podcast. They they remember when such ideas, an idea like gay marriage would have just been off the table, not socially acceptable, not politically acceptable, no legal way to make it happen, just, just off the table. And then this was reaffirmed with, met, you know, different uh, uh, voter initiatives in, in several states. Uh, well, now that's completely different. Okay, and and public sentiment changed uh, first. I, I, I think uh, I think that could be demonstrated easily. Although that's a, you know that's certainly a contestable hypothesis. But public sentiment seemed to be shifting, and you know eventually the the courts followed. And it and see, it doesn't matter if you think gay marriage is a good idea uh, or a bad idea. Uh, the Overton window says nothing about whether a policy is good. It just talks about changing. Changing um, changes in policy, changes in ideas. It's a value neutral concept. Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, uh, I mentioned the environmental movement uh, 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 a while ago. You, you don't have to like a movement in order to say that sentiment has changed and and the laws followed, and and sometimes change can go too far. We saw it with prohibition. Uh, the people wanted uh, <laughs> spiritous liquors prohibited in the United States, and they were, and they got what they asked for, and then they decided that they didn't like it, and so that uh, that prohibition was undone. Good point to bring back to what we were talking about earlier, that you know, you may think you want X, or you may get <laughs> X, but you may get Y and Z as well, and you may find out that that was not a good trade-off to make. Yeah, the, the unintended, you know, the unintended consequences and second and third order effects of Various policies. I mean, I'm I'm no scholar in prohibition, but I know other scholars have made the case that uh, you know we we've got uh, fairly strong organized crime uh, because of prohibition. You know, well, would would people have wanted that if they knew that that was part of the bargain? Who knows? And uh, and that's why. That's why the work of people outside of government, you know, like ACT and like the Mackinac Center is so important to, you know, try to try to point these things out. We can look at drunk driving as an area where policy has changed. I remember as a kid, um, too, you know, too young to drink, but old enough to understand what was going on on cartoons when it was a funny subject to show somebody too drunk to walk, too drunk to speak <laughs> correctly, uh, too drunk to drive. You know, these were uh, subject for humor. When it was, you know, when you think about the lives ruined, uh, that part of it was never funny. And, and eventually – through organizations like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, uh, again, you know, I, I wouldn't call them a think tank, but they they played a role that a think tank can play by really articulating um, vividly a, a, a problem that lawmakers are not paying sufficient attention to, perhaps, and they shifted the Overton window, and now we've got you know much stricter drunk driving laws. Nobody laughs at that anymore, and the tolerance levels are way down, and the penalties are are more severe. And has it overshot, you know, what the public wants? Who knows? I mean, maybe maybe it has, but um, uh, the, the people, you know, the people who have lost loved ones to drunk drivers probably would never think that uh, of that. We uh, we can look at the pandemic policies right now, and it's another important. Looking at the pandemic uh, allows us to observe another thing that shifts the Overton window, Eric, and it isn't just uh, the work of think tanks and uh, persuasion, you know, as mighty as we think we may be. Sometimes circumstances, unpredictable circumstances can change people's views on public policy. So people had forgotten what pandemics were like. And even though statistically, you know, that one was bound to happen again. And we got a, you know, we got a good one with, uh, or not good in the sense of, uh, please give me another. Yes. But uh, <laughs> we, we got a, a pandemic and the public policy shifted in response to it in, in uh, many ways. I, what I think we're seeing is that uh, the lawmakers overshot 
in many ways because the, the public uh, essentially just refused to comply with a lot of the restrictions. And we, we see uh, courts striking down some of the most uh, marquee restrictions or, or mandates like the, like the uh, uh, vaccine mandate from the federal government. So, you know, the pandemic didn't spring from anyone's mind like an idea. Uh, the pandemic just, uh, you know, came from nature and it changed people's views on what are acceptable acceptable restrictions on civil liberties. At least it did for a while. People were willing to tolerate some of that for a while and they're less tolerant now. You see it in that case changing quickly. Right? Is what was um, – I was actually just writing a piece uh, about this that I expect to be in the Detroit News um, relatively soon. How – of course, what was acceptable at the very beginning when the amount of information we had on this virus was limited uh, changed over time as we've grown to understand it more and understand the variants that have come from it more. And the question that we should be asking ourselves is, well, of, of course, is what is appropriate for the moment and what is appropriate in January of 2022 when we're talking is radically different than what reasonable people, I think, could have determined was appropriate in April of 2020. Uh, another example, I think, of a longer run one that I thought of as you were talking is, is cigarette smoking. Mm -hmm. That we – you could actually look to – there were certainly actions that uh, governments took, but – Largely, it was a campaign. You know, I can contrast this with the uh, say the war on drugs. Um, we didn't make cigarette smoking illegal. People engaged in a sustained campaign over years and decades to persuade people that smoking really wasn't good for them. So you go from you know four out of five doctors prefer camels to the. A, a world where you can't people don't smoke in bars anymore and restaurants, and it is a marginalized behavior and from a individual uh, perspective, one can feel the way that they want to about all of that, but it was a sustained campaign to convince people that something wasn't good for them. And we see the effects of that successful campaign now in what the world looks like in 2022, as opposed to even 15 years ago where, you know, I can remember being in, in bars in Chicago and in Decatur, Illinois, where I went to college, where you'd, you know, pick up the clothes the next morning that you wore out and they still smell like <laughs> cigarette smoke. It's a radical change, uh, but over an extended period of time in this case. Yeah, it, it simply has become less fashionable in, uh, you know, among fashion leaders, I guess uh, you, you, you might say. That's right. And f fashions uh, go in and out of style, uh, just, you know, just like ideas do. And, you know, it always – it's always uh, affected by information that's available, but it's not necessarily determined by information that's available. It's uh, – the interesting thing about putting policies in place is that we then get to see uh, for sure what the trade-offs will be. And I, I think uh, going back to the pandemic when, uh, you know – there was a much greater sense in society of, hey, let's let's go along with these restrictions. Uh, number one, because we're being told they're not going to last very long. <laughs> number two, because we're being told they'll be effective, they'll work. Uh, let's go go along with them. And uh, what we found was uh, th there were we began to see the trade-offs. And my organization, the Mackinac Center, actually litigated on behalf of uh, a medical practitioner whose practice – he essentially had to close his practice due to uh, Michigan's COVID restrictions under Governor Whitmer. And consequently, his patients who needed you know, routine care weren't able to get it. Uh, some of his uh, – at least one of his patients uh, contracted gangrene because he wasn't a, able to have a, uh, a feeding appliance serviced. I mean this, this, is, this is horrible. So now 
You know, on the one hand, you you have governor saying my policies are saving lives, and on the other hand, we're saying, okay, but they're also contributing to gangrene here, which takes lives, and, and the trade-offs became more and more apparent. And now multiply that story times you know uh, times a million, and, and people uh, began to get a different sense of the the value of the restrictions. As you mentioned, uh, Joe Overton passed away young in two thousand and three. Clearly. It's reflected in the conversation that we're having today and the use of the term, the Overton window. Um, he'll be remembered for that concept. Why else should we remember Joe Overton? What a delightful question to answer uh, because he was just such a fine man and I need to make a distinction here. We're all familiar with what happens when someone dies and especially when they die young and sort of in the prime of life and at the top of their game. Everyone has good qualities and people talk about uh, the good qualities of the, the departed. And you know, although it's probably a little, little rude to say, uh, but I think we all have seen this, that uh, people tend to tend to play up the good stuff and downplay the bad stuff because everybody has bad qualities too. But I can honestly say that every time that I've uh, I've been asked to describe Joe, I don't have to exaggerate uh, how great a man he was. He was a wonderful, wonderful friend uh, to be around, uh, a wonderful mentor uh, who he really more than any other person, uh, he is why I'm in this business and why I left engineering and and ended up at uh, Mackinac Center and Cato Institute for a while and back at Mackinac Center. Uh, he was uh, – Joe was a Christian, uh, believed that very deeply. He, he led a Bible study that I was part of uh, for a while. Uh, it was my uh, privilege to uh, be one of his eulogists where uh, I, I was able to uh, uh, talk about that, talk about that part of his uh, – life as well. And, and so I made fun of Joe's concept of, uh, of a balanced uh, life. Um, Joe, <laughs> Joe was balanced in the way that a rocket ship is balanced. And so this, I'm getting into engineer territory a little bit here, but in a, a rocket ship uh, is a balanced force system where all the force is focused through a single point. <laughs> you know, you've got the engine in the back and it's all forced through, uh, you know, uh, so the rocket flies straight straight ahead. Those systems are very difficult to control. <laughs> but uh, for when you would tell Joe to slow down, take a break, take a breath, it was like, no, there's more to be done. There's more work to do. And uh, he, he was he was that. Uh, that that was his idea of balance. We used to make fun of him uh, because of it, and we we miss him very much. I, I wish we could have seen uh, what uh, he would have accomplished uh, on on Earth, but he has gone to his heavenly reward. Joseph Lehman is president of the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, an independent nonprofit research and educational institute in Michigan. Joe, thank you so much for joining us today on Active Mind. Thank you, Eric. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Gabriel Zsa. Zsa.